Hello, and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program of Masons from around the world who get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. The standard disclaimer applies. The thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, you can send us a message via Twitter, at Mason Roundtable, or on our Facebook event page on episode 188, The White Apron for Life. You know me, John Ruark, past master of the Patriot Lodge, number 1957, in Fairfax, Virginia. I'll hand it off to Mike for his new introductions. Mike the intern. Hi, it's uh, Mike Hambrecht of uh, Triandria Lodge, number 780, and I have just been installed this evening as the junior steward and the lodge education officer. Very nice. Congratulations. Thank you. That's like hot off the press, right? That is, very, yeah. Like I said, maybe about an hour ago. That's right, just about that. <laughs> Congrats again. Thanks. All right, next up, with a newly grown beard coming in, Juan Sepulveda. Hello, everybody. Juan Sepulveda here from Orange Blossom Lodge number 80 in Kissimmee, Florida, and the host of the Winding Stairs Freemasonry Podcast. Thank you for having me, brothers. Thank you, Juan. And last but not least for tonight, Brother Jason Richards. Hey, good evening, everybody. Jason Richards here, um, a little bit gruffer than normal. Uh, still Worshipful Master, Vacation Lodge number 16 in Clifton, Virginia. Also a member of the Colonial Lodge number 1821 in Washington, D.C. Excellent, excellent. Well, before we go, we have a, a quick sponsor plug. We want to tell you about this week's episode has been sponsored by worshipful brother ryan j flynn who is a masonic artist and patent designer out of new hampshire since 2010 brother flynn has been using a variety of mediums to capture beautiful masonic architecture people medieval style patents and other masonic works of art Bri uh, brother ryan is available to do custom commission works for masons and masonic lodges if you haven't seen them they're beautiful if you are interested in commissioning a piece with brother ryan contact him directly at ryan at ryan j flynn with two ends.com or visit his website at www ryan j flynn.com and of note if you were at the masonic roundtables 300 event uh, brother ryan created the patent for our 300 event last june so his work is incredible you will want to check it out and here is a screenshot of his website the best part is you'll want to keep going back to his website because he's in the process of updating it. So I'm sure you'll see new work, new uh, new products being listed, and, and other new services he provides. So check that out. Thanks a lot, Ryan J. Flynn. Yeah, he's uh, I think he's one of my favorites uh, as far as Masonic artists go, outside of our very own Juan Sepulveda, of course. But uh, the work that Ryan does is incredible. And recently had a birthday, and a recent father again. So this guy's been a little busy this year. So <laughs> congratulations on all of those accounts. First up, let's talk about Masonic news. First item is No Shave November. In case you haven't noticed, we do have a little bit of uh, dirt on our faces, and that is all supporting a good cause. And I will bring up the, the No Shave link here. If you want to help out a good cause just for no reason in particular, <clears throat> go check out noshave.org slash team slash TMR, or just go to our website and you'll find a link there. We're already 10% toward our goal, and the uh, best part is, is you can donate to your favorite host of the, the Masonic Roundtable. So show your love with, with your wallet. And to sweeten the deal, we have a couple of little perks added in. <clears throat> I know that uh, last week, we had uh, Brother Dave Bacon on the show who offered that the highest bidder or contributor, don donator, donor, yeah, donor, that's the word I'm looking for, on, on this page will actually get one of his custom hand-painted aprons, which is a fantastic deal. I mean, just Google it. Just Google hand-painted aprons. You're going to see his works, and you're going to see other works, and you're going to see about the type of value that you're getting just by donating uh, to this this good cause. Uh, what else did we say that we were going to offer there, Jason? So in addition to <clears throat> Brother Dave Bacon, who is uh, 
does some fantastic aprons. He's actually, I've commissioned him to do my past master's apron. I'm very excited about uh, getting that over the next couple weeks. Uh, anyone who donates at least $25 in my name is going to get a, uh, a couple of sweet pins for me. I'm going to dig into my vault of old TMR pins and come up with a couple of our uh, early prototype designs to send. Again, anyone who donates at least $25 in my name, uh, you'll get a nice handwritten note of thanks as well. But wait, there's more. Because uh, there last is. I said I, I was going to think of something that's uh, unique that I can help contribute to this. And for the highest donor in my name, I'm going to offer one of these screen used skulls, Scully here, that uh, I'll send over to you, maybe with a couple of little tchotchkes along the way. So you can, you can count on having your very own TMR used merchandise uh, right there as uh, part of your contribution. Your so, choice or donor's choice? No, I can't, can't do donor's choice. Some of these are <laughs> worth <laughs> a lot. But uh, again, I'll, I'll throw in a couple extra things too, a little bonus as well. So you got that going for you. Autograph the skull. <laughs> That's right. There you go. Might as well. And actually, whoever donates to me, hold on. Oh, oh, wait, there's more. <clears throat> Mike, the intern, has walked away from the microphone. Yeah, but I'm back. Uh, I actually am only holding two of them, but I have a set, a complete set of Introduction to Freemasonry by Claudie. I will send those off. Carl Claudie, look at that. Yeah, so for the uh, highest donor in my name. Now I'm ready to start dropping money now. I mean, <laughs> good deal, good stuff. It's all in good fun, so I appreciate uh, everyone mm -hmm. jumping in on this. And, uh, Again, we're 10% there. Let's see if we can keep bumping it up. We'll just be running it through November, so clock's ticking, guys. Thanks. Well, I I'm, I'm missing here. What? Someone donates. But wait, there's the, more. The highest amount donated on my name is going to get a surprise. And when I say surprise, I'm going to surprise you. Just, just put, your <laughs> put your trust in that number, and I'll send you something real nice. We'll send them a mystery box. <laughs> I'll keep it a mystery. <laughs> uh, mysteries from Juan. Sounds like a romantic novel. I'm very, very sneaky. I'm just going to donate a dollar to Juan. <laughs> just, I'll be like yeah. the highest donor. So far, you would be, yeah. <laughs> no love for Juan. Okay, let's see. Moving on. Next up, we have... A smartphone app for traveling Masons. Yes, that's right. This week we learned from Chris Hodap's blog about a new smartphone app in development called Amity, <clears throat> which is a spinoff, a, a competitor to the List of Lodges Masonic, published annually by Pentagraph Printing. Uh, for any of those who... Pantograph Printing. Pan Pantograph. Oh, I, I mean, Pentagraph would be cooler, but no, it's Pant... Upside down. So if you turn the list of lodges Masonic upside down, then <laughs> you get, and you get a, a goat skull and the sigil of the Church of Satan and whatnot. <laughs> you get some Carmina playing in the background. It's great. <laughs> uh, no, so this app is to be used as a companion for traveling brothers who are going to different jurisdictions. And um, if you enter in your lodge and Grand Lodge, they do a little bit of vetting, which is nice. This is how this is different from anything else, just random databases and websites that are out there. They'll, they'll make sure that you are in a, a just and regular jurisdiction, and we'll show you <clears throat> a filtered list of jurisdictions you can travel to. So uh, this will really help with Traveling Brothers going to and from, as well as quickly checking on your, on your smart device, both Android and, and Apple, um, the lists of, of Traveling Brothers that, that you're allowed to have a Masonic correspondence with. So it's pretty neat. It is a work in progress. And uh, as Chris Hodap says, it's uh, the yeoman's work for sure. Bec because even if nothing else, even if you had it down perfectly, someone's going to change recognition. <laughs> to include, <laughs> to include today, Alabama. Alabama. <laughs> Next up, uh, according to, from Reddit, 
mutual recognition has been achieved in Sweet Home, Alabama. So uh, this is confirmed coming out of the, um, there was a, a grand annual communication from the Most Worshipful Grand Lodge of Alabama, and they voted today in the affirmative to allow for mutual recognition. Now, for those, we've talked about this. Visitation. Right. We've talked about this about a year ago when on the last date or so did the same. And uh, big difference between recognition and co-visitation. So um, short answer is co-visitation allows you to travel back and forth um, between lodges in the same jurisdiction. Uh, this is at least one step forward in the name of progress. Um, for example, I know Texas did this a few years ago um, where they, they spent a year or two under recognition before they then extend a visitation. So it's just a kind of uh, a cooling off period, a, you know, a step in the right direction. So we have to, to give it as that. Uh, we'd all like to go see it a little bit quicker. Yeah. But, um, if it works, let's go with it. There's, there's a detail there that, you know, some people are not very familiar with. And the fact that the secretaries and grand secretaries of one body cannot communicate with the other officially unless they recognize one another. Otherwise, it's just like you're talking to some organization that's not even established. So this allows for the formal and documented uh, communication between grand lodges. So that's one of the reasons why it's, it seems like a very uh, insignificant step to many. And I've, I've been a part of, well, I've been observing a lot of conversations online today about it where some people are just minimizing the importance of this step. And I just want to put it in perspective. This is one step in the right direction because it, it acknowledges that this other organization is um, regular, basically. It's, it's uh, uh, well, I don't think it, it determines regularity, does it? Is it regular? It's, it's recognized is the, the word. Because they could become recognized, but then they could still have differences in the way that they do things, and that has to be you know, meshed together. But anyway, um, it is not an insignificant step, and I wanted to uh, compare it to something. Let's say you like a female, and you want to get to marry her. That first hello, that first interaction that you have with that person whether you end up in bed on the first day or not is significant it's one step in the right direction and if you want it to be something that lasts something that is solid a good uh connection then you you don't take for granted those little steps that first hello the first uh you know the first time you die and the first time you go out and do something together so just look any courtship requires little steps that are that are important and they need to be valuable for the both parties involved so if you want to take this one to all the way then I... <laughs> uh, we just need like a tinder app from for masons that's all just just swipe right baby swipe right yeah and, and there's a map Except uh, in the case of arkansas you <laughs> always swipe left when it comes to arkansas <laughs> Ah, uh, so that happened. Yeah, let's see how soon we can do something similar here in Florida. There you go. Progress. <clears throat> okay. okay, so topic for tonight is one suggested by Brother Ryan Amoit of Santa Lucia Lodge 302 out of King City, California. And he suggested the title White Apron for Life. What do you do about brethren who just are satisfied by being on the sidelines or not proceeding any further than the uh, junior deacon's chair. So let's step back. Here at, here at uh, TMR, we have done a lot of special topics regarding lodge officers and their duties, uh, what it's like to be you know, a worshipful master, or the challenges there, what to do after your worshipful master, um, and all the leadership that goes into, into that. And so I think it's it's time to discuss uh, the section of the membership that is actually the largest portion of the membership, which have no intention of 
you know, running up through the chairs in a leadership position um, because there's nothing wrong with that at all. So I wanted to go through a couple of ideas all of us have had on, on the benefits of doing that, as well as some other things you can do as a quote unquote regular member with all the rights and benefits therein uh, to contribute back to your lodge. And so Juan, being the most creative of all of us here tonight, uh, had really had the ball rolling when we were discussing what we're going to talk about tonight. And so I'm going to hand it off to Juan to get the ball rolling. Thank you, John. Uh, I wanted to start by pointing something out. I am a white apron brother myself. You, you're I, a past master thrice. I'm not a past master. I'm not a nothing. Uh, <laughs> I am a member of Orange Blossom Lodge number 80 and barely. <laughs> and, and it is important to, to point out, um, I challenge anybody who would say that I've done nothing for the fraternity or that I've done nothing in masonry. I haven't, uh, you know, contributed to 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 the craft. Now, the important thing is this, is to keep that there is nothing wrong with not having a leadership position in or, in an organization. Not everybody can be the captain. Not everybody desires to be the at the helm of an organization. And one of the wordings that I that I I thought about is that you can be what we termed in this uh, in in this episode as a as a white apron brother. Uh, it is by choice. It's not necessarily a handicap. It's not. It's not something to be frowned upon. It's not something to uh, to belittle. And it, it is just as important as any other brother because we meet on the level. So the first thing to, to discuss and to consider is the fact that not everybody wants to be a leader. And some brothers join masonry because they want to receive lessons that are time-tested and they want to apply those to their lives and they want to do so they want to be an active participant of the experience but not necessarily be at the helm of it and you know before i uh paso la batuta before i <laughs> hand over the the baton uh i just wanted to mention one experience i had in in lodge early on i knew that i wanted to be in the officer line if given the opportunity um <clears throat> i I'm I'm very driven and I I I like leadership. I, I like to I like to do things. I want to be responsible for for putting things together and brainstorming things. And I remember desiring to be a part of the officer line. And the furthest I went was junior deacon in Adiola Lodge. And I remember one night we had a brother approaching uh, elections. And there was a brother that I respected. He was very quiet, very, very meek. But I thought that he could contribute in, in one of the, the positions. And I approached them personally. And, and I asked them, have you considered being in the officer line? And I remember how he explained it. He said, I'm happier sitting here with my brothers then I know I would be trying to, you know, corral them or put them together uh, to work. So I prefer, I prefer not to. I just prefer to live the rest of my life as a Mason. And it really made me think because for some illogical reason, I thought everyone, everyone wanted to be <laughs> in the, in the officer line. And I was, I was mistaken. He was, perfectly fine there so i have no judgments whatsoever for his decision right and we, we've mentioned it before that everybody gets something different out of masonry and you know we've mentioned about the leadership positions that um lodge leadership actually is an easy way to gain some of those leadership skills because it is a low risk environment um it's not usually not in front of thousands of people and so you can actually get used to public speaking and that, that kind of thing if you're not familiar with that. Uh, but again, if you have no intentions of getting any leadership experience, there's still a plethora of things that masonry has to offer for, uh, for you. So 
Mike, what say you, Mr. Uh, <laughs> running up the chairs? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I when we first had, came up with this idea, my first thought was, man, what could we possibly talk about? <laughs> you know, but then as I thought about it, I mean, uh, being, you know, if you don't want to be active in the officer's line, there is actually plenty of other opportunities. There's committees. There's, um, you know, even just uh, doing education. You don't have to be the lodge education officer to do that. You can go before the lodge and, you know, present, uh, you know, do something, you know, educational. You can, um, uh, you can actually uh, uh, spend a lot of time on the charity committees. You can be the guy who just says, you know what, I don't want to be in the officer's line, but you know what, I'll cook all of our dinners. I mean, we I have a brother in one of my lodges that really, that's what he likes to do, you know. He's also the tiler at this point, but that's just because he's, you know, keeps him outside the room to take care of the dinner, you know. Um, other than that, I mean, he, you know, that's what he does. But anyone could do that same kind of thing, you know, and still just be participating in lodge. You know, so. the, the dinner one is a, is a great one because uh, I know in my mother lodge, Herndon Lodge, throughout the, the my tenure there, we've had both. Uh, we've had a, a chef of a very high class restaurant in the area um, as a member of the lodge. Hmm. He would he would actually that would be his contribution to the lodge is to cook the meals, and they were fantastic. And the best part was, you know, we, we are kind of the typical, you know, lodge that the the gas range hasn't been updated in forty years and that kind of stuff. But this guy could come in, and just pull down the spice rack or whatever's left there, and it's all you know off the shelf McCormick spices, right? It's nothing fancy. Mm -hmm. But he can turn water into wine with the way that he could. And spice. Not Virginia, dry state. Right, not, not to wine. <laughs> I don't know anything about that. But man, the food he could make with such a little limited um, set of ingredients. And, and, and oh, man, it's just fantastic. The other uh, brother we had was actually um, used to be, I believe it was uh, George Bush's, uh, George W's um, chef. At one point in time, so he's kind of kind of experienced as well. So that's the little thing. Both of those brothers never took any other officer position, but definitely contribute to the fellowship that the lodge had. Um, Jason, how else can people be active without being an officer? Well, you know, two of the most long-standing members of Acacia Lodge, uh, one of whom is a sixty-five-plus-year member. Uh, never made it through the officer's chairs and never became an officer. And they're actually both trustees of the lodge. Um, <clears throat> the one is our Tyler, who's been our Tyler for the past 25 years. And uh, I find it hilarious that he's a trustee of our lodge because he attempts to break our door every meeting uh, with how loud he raps. True um, story. Yes. Uh, but the, the other one, Brother Doug, has been a member for upwards of 65 years. And um, he's, he has served on various committees. One of the big things that he does for our lodge um, and has been doing forever has been he puts together the investigation committees for all the new candidates. And he's been doing that forever. So there are so many ways that you can serve without being a, a line officer. And, um, you know, I'd say if, not not everyone should be an officer. I think there are some folks who are much more comfortable with leadership in an official capacity than than others. And I don't think if you aren't comfortable um, leading in an official capacity that you should be forced to do so. But there are plenty of other ways that you can impact your lodge for the better and um, impact your brethren for the better and, and being a trustee or helping on committees um, can uh, can be a way that you can, as you know, a, a brother on the sidelines, help um, work toward the betterment of your lodge, taking parts and degrees as well. Yeah, that's very true. So, so one, um, it, it's important, right, that you look down on these these brothers who are certainly not willing to step up and be an officer, right, because. They're they're just not 
really just quality members, right? Is that is that a true statement? Exactly. You got to <laughs> remind them of their place. <laughs> no, if you imagine it going to a uh, it, it we've seen it happen. But. Yeah, and I think it's wrong. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Even if the brother didn't want to get involved in anything, what if the brother, all he wants to do is on Tuesday nights, get in on his car, in his car, about his car, around his car. These, I don't know. My, my English gets in the way sometimes. He uh, gets in the car, go straight to lodge, sit down with a few brothers, have a nice dinner, have a good conversation with some younger uh, Masons, inspire them in those conversations, go through the meeting and go home. Even that is is permissible. It's acceptable. It's okay, you know. Uh, having that, what I described as that grassroot uh, impact within the lodge is important. Even if he didn't took, take part in any committee whatsoever, just the fact that he is willing to listen and speak to other brothers and contribute to their Masonic experience, that is incredibly valuable. I think. And you've seen sometimes what happens when there's not enough members in a lodge and you're forced to pick from within a very thin uh, selection of brothers to, to a leadership position. You risk the, you know, you take the risk of maybe, I can't, I want to say tarnish the experience for them in masonry, but I guess tarnish is, is is a little strong of a of a word, but you you could add some pressures that they weren't necessarily or you know desiring. So just having that brother be there for you is is good enough, and for us to look down on them it would be it just be sad. You know that's why I, I'm an advocate for calling everybody brother. You know, if you're in a, if you're presenting someone with some high honors and high rank, you know, perhaps, yeah, you use the titles and call them respectively. But in, I'm a, I'm a believer that you should call a brother a brother and that you should never be um, reprehended for it. Yeah. And, and so the opposite is also true. And um, this is something that I picked on early on in one of the episodes of the winding stairs because I saw, I saw it to be true, which is uh, related to some of the clicks in masonry and how, um, you know, you'll, especially as a new candidate, even not even a Mason yet, you're going to see brethren at your meeting that your, your, your social hours or dining before lodge that have jewels up and down, you know, they have the lapel pin extender and everything. And like, wow, that guy, he's been around for a while. And you know, you really don't know. Like, should should I should I talk to him? What do I, what do I call him? Do I call him brother? Do I call him, you know, what like what's his title? I don't know. And uh, often that that means they cannot be approachable just by the mere fact of their presence. Um, you know, we're not going to get the whole like crotchety past master bit, but just yeah, yeah, just yeah. The, the the mere fact that. Um, when they wear their honors on their sleeves, literally, um, it, it makes them less approachable. And so um, that actually means that your white apron only brothers, uh, in effect, could be the most level. They could be the most approachable because they don't have, they're not wearing their exaltations on, on their sleeve. So yeah. what, what do you think about that? Uh I think it, 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 Mike, you wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, I, I think that that could, especially in a, on a younger, and when I say younger, I don't mean by age. I mean someone who just recently joined Masonry. Uh, a new brother uh, may be uh, dissuaded from actually approaching the table that has all the collars and all the <laughs> all the jewels and everything and i've used the expression before we meet on the level but we dine on separate tables yeah, to make a point that you know you have the table of the past so masters. yeah <laughs> uh you have the table of the past masters in one side you have the newbies you know trying to figure everything out in one table and you have the 
past grand sovereign, most exalted, you know, whatever is in another table. And uh, for those jewels, uh, I think that it is important to try to retain that approachability. Uh, there's nothing nicer. You know, I love and I try to do it anytime I, that I can. When I go to visit a lodge, if I'm going to speak, if I'm going to uh, to be involved in any way, I try to go to all the all the tables in, in the dining hall and shake everybody's hands and introduce myself uh, and you know try to learn a little bit about who everyone is. And when I'm at home in my lodge, if I notice that there's someone who is who is new that looks a little bit out of place, I. I try to make it a point to invite him over to my table or make, you know, be the, the network, uh, be the connector, be the one that puts them together in a table or joins them with another, with someone else. So, you know, another benefit, like, like we, we discussed of just being a white apron brother is the fact that you may be more approachable to some of these newer members or potential candidates and you could be that one person that really makes a difference in in that person's search for light. So, absolutely, Mike. Yeah, and uh, what I was thinking too. One of the things that you know uh, these white apron uh, only masons could do, their experience could make them some of the better mentors as well. You know, they aren't. Uh, they aren't tied to the officer's line. They aren't stuck with the idea of, oh, you know, this is what you have to do. This is the direction and this is how you're going to get there. They may actually just explain to a brother how to be a Mason, not how to be an officer. Yeah. Um, and That's provide them with, you know, a lot more of that kind of education in that manner. So... Um, and now as for, you know, off, you know, the big, the high muckety muck ones, I'll tell you, you know, some of those, even though they have all those nice, you know, emblems on and everything, I've found some of them to be more, very approachable if you just do so. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at them and go, man, I don't know how to talk to that guy. Um, two of my favorite ones, one was a past uh, Grand High Priest of Ohio, a member of my lodge. And then uh, that was very approachable. And then, uh, well, Don McAndrews, when I was down in Virginia, I mean, I can't say, you know, enough good about him. <laughs> yeah. Nice guy. He's, he gets around. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they may be intimidating, but they're still approachable. Yeah. These are your brothers, after all. And these are brothers right. that they travel and travel and travel. Like, they meet, you know brothers from all kinds of lodges, you know, from the ones up in the, and, uh, you know, developments and, you know, like in the city and they go out to the rural, like they, they, they find themselves really connecting with people from all, uh, from all walks of life. So I, I just, I love the idea that you don't have to commit to, taking all this burden of leadership and learning things other than, you know, helping yourself improve and help others improve in their own journey. It's almost like it's stripping Freemasonry of complications to a degree. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's, I'll be honest. I, I like the idea of some guys who, you know, uh, wouldn't want to be, uh, officers you know i mean and and working within the lodge and being mentors and you know uh taking that you know and and honestly being that example even you know because you know there's plenty of guys who try to go through the line that and we've talked about this in past episodes that um i mean maybe should never have tried you know um for other for various reasons you know but the fact is you know those that don't, they're just as good for all of us. Right. And I think, you know, we're hitting on, a, on an interesting point that we all have different talents to bring as well. So even mm -hmm. though we all get to something different out of masonry and leadership may not be one of those, we all have those unique talents using kind of the example of, of the chefs that we've had at Herndon Lodge. But 
if you if you're great and you love mowing grass, great. The grass needs to be mowed at, at the lodge, and you can volunteer to help out with that because I'm sure there will be people that will pick you up on that, right? Um, you know, if you if you're just like being an, an ear to hear whatever a brother has on their mind, you, know, you you you've got some sort of you know knack to empathize with people, and you're 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 getting a vibe from from someone you know, at, at dinner that they're having an off night or having some family problems, some troubles at home. Uh, you just be right there for that brother, right? Your officers aren't necessarily going to be doing that because they're going to be getting ready for the meeting. And they're going to be worrying about, oh, what do I do for this visitor? And uh, do I have my program ready for the night? And, uh, oh, my gosh, there's so many things to do, blah, blah, blah. When if you can just be that, that ear for somebody as just a white apron for life, yeah, that's much more valuable to that brother right then and there than the entire meeting. So you find your talent. Find what you can give. So, again, being a white apron for life does not mean being lazy either. It means finding yep. your unique talent. <laughs> that's outside of the officer duties. Mm -hmm. Contribute that as well, right? Um, there, you have to put a little bit of sweat, sweat equity as well into masonry because, as the old adage goes, and it's it's so true, uh, the very first piece of advice from my mentor was, you get out of masonry what you put in it. And it sounds cliche, and it applies at all levels. Mm -hmm. it does. Because if you put in that time, to help your lodge and in, in whatever your unique talents are. Hey, we need to update the website. Great, go do it. Right, get right. the workshop master permission. Run with it because if it, if it needs to be done, I'm sure someone's thought about it or doesn't have the skills. Go for it, and, and you'll find that you will be uh, self-actualized. You'll you'll feel better that you contributed. You had a little bit of control and, and creation in that. Uh, you know that's that's really where masonry shines as a whole because we are the gestalt we are the sum of all of the parts to make up one one greater whole yeah. and another way that i learned that you know um a white apron has uh contributed well in some lodges is and and was being criticized for not doing his you know being an officer but the guy who was criticizing was actually uh uh, reminded that this brother visits a lot of the shut-ins and a lot of the older brothers who end up in nursing homes. He spends a lot of his time with these guys and um, being more brotherly than a lot of the officers in that line. So, yeah, it was, it's, it, you know, so there's a good way for that too, you know, and that's, that's another talent as she, as it were, because not everybody can actually go and sit with, shut-ins or even nursing homes you know you mentioned that and it reminds me uh i know i've mentioned this before in other episodes but one thing that they they did at iolo lodge uh, in orlando is that they they had a list um of the of the the different talents or different skills that brothers had so there was the the secretary had access to a list where for example you had you know, these brothers are have an affinity for for poetry. They actually write poetry. They can recite it. They they're good at this. Uh, you had other brothers who are you know visual artists, you know graphic designers, fine artists, and you had musicians and you had uh, people that had different uh, uh, craft skills. You know, tradesmen from different industries, and these are all services that could be put to the use of improving the lodge the physical lodge the structure but also the you know the essential lodge or, or the people so it is important i think it was it was important for us to be able to have a place where we could go and say okay well we're going to put together a family night and we might need some people who are good with with tech to put together projectors and the consoles and the video games and you know we might need someone who has an affinity for, you know, like we have a lot of brothers who who are part of the shrine and they might like um they they have other brothers who do um clown makeup and that kind of stuff that can, they can contribute that to yeah, exactly. So they can contribute to to a family event and paint faces or come dressed up and entertain the kids. So you think outside of the box and any skill that can come to mind, a brother in your lodge could have it. He doesn't have to be a 
uh, a past master. He doesn't have to have any kind of title. He is the brother who is good at X or Y, and he shines on that meeting. He's the one that can come in one night and give you a talk about uh, food or maybe, you know, I don't know. It's These are things that there's the the possibilities are, are endless. But if you know where to look to see who has which skills, then you have a lot of brothers who are are there to help and and make a memorable experience that night. Good. So I think we'll so I think we'll refer to to social media. Social right? media. And we'll start with uh, Nathan Rolofson, who adds to advance to the east, a mason should know the ritual and be able to lead the lodge. Some masons do not have these skills, but can help with dinners, chip events, meaning the uh, child ID programs, uh, play the dirge on the piano or organ, or have other skills useful to a lodge. Also, lodges should also re remember to keep their past masters involved. There are too many lodges where masons go through the chairs, never to return after they have served as past master. Uh, so Nathan adds at least two more things that we didn't mention tonight about contributing to some of the charity events, specifically um, the child ID programs. Um, we have we do volunteer work at um, Herndon Lodge where we have a big Herndon uh, you know, festival, kind of a local... Uh, I don't know what you call it, a uh, an annual event with carnivals and rides and all that. And fair? So, yeah, fair. And um, so we need volunteers to work kind of security. Our lodge has been uh, helping out with that for many, many years. Uh, and again, that's something that's very easy to do. In fact, you just kind of stand around for about two hours, but they need those bodies to, uh, to guard the entrances and just make sure people's, no one's bringing anything in. They're not supposed to. Very easy to do. But it requires, um, you know, man, you know, manpower to, to run that um, music. Right? Uh, he talked about the piano or the organ. Right? People, some brothers have that talent as well. That's something that's sorely needed uh, as as ambience brought in. And we've talked a lot about that in our, our music episode. So uh, check that out as well. Any other thoughts on that? Uh, Donnie Dillon brings up an interesting point that uh, no one had ever said anything to him, but he had received some sideways looks when he's addressed men in purple aprons simply as brother. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for the, the newest brothers, like don't be too nervous about that part. There are so many titles, you know, for you to figure out who to call right honorable and right worshipful and most worshipful and, and all these different titles, that's confusing at first. And it's of course, confusing after 10 years, trust yeah. me. You pick it up, but at first it, it could be intimidating, but don't let that get in the way of you connecting with another brother. So just because you might not know exactly how to address them, don't let that get in the way of you establishing a relationship with that brother. You know, that might be the one thing you need to do in order to to really feel at home and really feel comfortable in your lodge or your uh, district meeting. So so I encourage all the brothers to, um, you know, the brothers that have no intention of being in leadership positions, don't feel inadequate. Like you are the blood, you know, you're the life of the of the lodge. Otherwise, every meeting would be comprised only of 10 or 15 past masters in the <laughs> in you know sitting in, in in the columns and you know officers like we need brothers that are that are there but also a word of caution if you think you have it in you to be a part of it don't take this conversation as an excuse not to pursue it further so if you have uh some sort of innate leadership skills or it's a challenge that you feel you could be good at uh, don't don't use that the, the topic tonight as an excuse. Just you know, perhaps wait for the right moment and ask the right questions so that you can then uh, join the officer line or take a a leadership position within your lodge. Yeah, definitely. Remember, if you're looking for the officer's line at some point, do it at your own pace. Don't make the don't let the lodge necessarily dictate that for you. 
Yeah. Yeah. And you make the decisions because otherwise Mike would just be a brother. <laughs> Mike yeah, would be a white apron head to senior warden. That'd be great. Yeah. Got an opening. I'm sure you'll be fine. Just come on in. <laughs> Can't say no to my brother. You don't want to, you don't say no to me. That's uh, right. Last up, the, uh, uh, the famous, infamous Alex Powers brings up a good point that having someone that is designated to keep up with all the brothers who did not attend Lodge would be epic as well. It's something he is trying to work in. Um, probably a handful more you could get to Lodge if we offered and organized rides to and from, right? I'll pick you up on the way to Lodge and drop you back off. And beyond that, we take an oath to these brothers to consider those in nursing homes um, that if nothing else, could use a good conversation and a friendly face. Uh, so um, I think that, that's, a, that's a great point, right? That is, again, that interpersonal skill that you could just say, you are the outreach committee. And we're not talking about outreach to the community. We're not talking to outreach to widows and orphans. We're talking to outreach just to our own. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that alone will turn around and pay dividends as well. And that requires no expertise. That requires no uh titles at all it requires no gold collars uh being able to pick up the phone and say hey brother i haven't seen you in lodge in a while we miss you what can we do for you yeah sometimes that, that's all it takes that's all. all it takes is someone to call you and say what's up like i haven't seen you in a while and maybe you don't need a ride or you don't need anything else all you need is that phone call or that text or that you know Little that spark. Email. yeah I, I do remember there was a moment that i was going through some uh some difficulty with, you know, my business and like, I don't know, I was in a position where everything was very chaotic and nothing was really gelling or moving forward. And I remember there was one brother, may he rest in peace, uh, the only brother that took the time to call me and say, hey, what's happening? Like, you need, like, you, you need to talk or something? And I said, just come over one day. And he actually came over to the house. We had lunch together here. And I had someone to talk to and bounce ideas off. And, uh, you know, just think that that might be all that person need. Maybe even if you don't go to lunch, having, a, you know, being that person that actually makes a difference in the life of another brother, like that is, that's invaluable. Uh, you can't replace that. So... You know, that brother, you know, passed on to the Celestial Lodge, but I I remember him with a lot of love that he took the time to call this young whippersnapper that, you know, others might have thought he was being rebellious, but no, he was just experiencing life <laughs> at a personal level. So well said. Great. Well, we're at that time of the night where we're going to start wrapping things up. Jason had to bail because if you listen to the show, he was getting a little raspy. So feel better, Jason. Let's switch over to Mike, the intern, for your final thoughts. Mike. Um, so, yeah, I, the way I see it, we need a lot more uh, white apron brothers anyway. Uh, because, honestly, we need to fill our lodges a little bit. <laughs> um I mean, I've been to plenty of lodge meetings where there was the entire officer line was there and upwards of maybe five more guys to show up. You know, that really doesn't uh, make much of a, a fun lodge, you know, I mean, and so the more white aprons we get showing up that just don't, I mean, that just want to participate doing that, the better, you know. Um, and then, you know, if we get some of those really wanting to stay along, you know, they can actually bring more in, you know, if they're working it right. Very true. All right. Thank you, Mike. Yep. Juan Sepulveda. Yep. I, I just wanted to to remind brothers, uh, if if it if it is in your heart to just be a participant and be a part of the of the lodge, see what are the what what's the role that you're going to fulfill that is going to make you the most satisfied and it's going to be the most effective for the people around you and it might be just the, the your role might be the listener or you might be the outreach person you might be the you know 
fun events person. Uh, it, it, but it's up to you. The important thing is that you make this experience your own, that you enjoy every moment, and that you fulfill the the initial intention of joining Masonry. Was it to take your, your rough edges and perfect them to be a, a better uh, you know, a, a better fit to the overall uh, edifice of society. If that is so, then take the steps necessary to make that happen. And I think, you know, I, I speak for, for what I've seen. Many times we neglect that component, even though it's the essential component of divesting yourself of the vices and superfluities and actually making yourself a useful component of the overall fabric of society and we forget that component we get so busy with you know leadership and busy with fundraisers and all these different things and we're not putting to work the the tools that are entrusted on on us so you know make this experience your own grow as as best as you can because if you don't then you you don't have enough to contribute to the other people around you so you know thank you as always for joining us and for listening and my sh shameless plug uh this week the november boxes for the mystery boxes for the winding stairs go out if you haven't heard about this we have a monthly subscription uh program in which you receive a box directly from me i curate uh, a collection of masonic items among them t-shirts, patches, books, stickers, uh, fine art, all kinds of different things. I try to put together something I would be excited to receive in the mail. And you could too. So to find out more, go to thewindingstairs.com and go to the shop section and you'll find it there. Thank you, brothers. Awesome. Thank you, Juan. Uh, let's see. To wrap things up again, feel free to donate to No Shave November. Go check out uh, the link on our, our website. Um, I was also on Ex Oriente this week, so if you like Masonic Podcast, go check out Ex Oriente. And we talked a little bit about the data analysis coming out of the Northern Masonic, Masonic Jurisdiction. So if you want to hear a little, little bit about that, go check that out. And expect to see something very soon um, as a special maybe half episode coming out this week of the data analysis I did uh, for the Masonic Society back in September. So I'm going to record that, share that with you so you can take that into your lodges and maybe make some changes in the upcoming Masonic year. And I'm going to close tonight with a, a poem that we actually have printed and, and hanging in my mother lodge entitled, Do You Just Belong? by Joseph Servaki. And I want you to think about this, how this applies even for those, those white aprons for life. Are you an active member, the kind that would be missed? Or are you just contented that your name is on the list? Do you attend the meetings and mingle with the flock? Or do you stay at home and criticize and knock? Do you take an active part to help the work along? Are you satisfied to be the kind that just belong? Do you ever go and visit a member that is sick? Or leave the work to a few and talk about that click? Think this over, member. You know right from wrong. Are you an active member or do you just belong? Thank you very much for watching. Keep searching for more light. See you next week.